Hello everybody and this is Rusty and today we're going to talk about the ACLS cardiac arrest shockable side of the algorithm. This is the 2020 update. Remember folks it's BLS before ALS. High quality CPR is needed. Assess the patient for breathing and a pulse for no more than 10 seconds. If you can't find in 10 seconds start compressions. Expose the chest, position your hands lower one third of the sternum between the nipple line and then push straight down so get your shoulders over top of that patient so you can push straight down we need to push hard and fast hard is two inches on an adult and fast is 100 to 120 compressions a minute and allow for complete chest recoil if you're pushing more than two compressions a second you need to slow down because that's over 120 a minute. Your compression to ventilation ratio is 30 compressions to two ventilations. Make sure you have that good CE clamp and you're giving that breath over one second and breathe and breathe. Remember the pace you need to be going is to the beat of staying alive. If you don't know 70s disco, then find yourself a metronome on your gadget phone there's all kinds of apps out there to keep pace for this 100 to 120 rate i i i i staying alive staying alive or if you're evil it is but a dump bump bump another one bites the dust so keep the pace so you're in between that 100 to 120 compressions a minute once the AD or monitor gets there, put the pads on the way the pictures tell you and assess if it's a shockable rhythm. If it's a shockable rhythm, don't delay, shock right away. Don't delay, shock right away. And those shockable rhythms are V-fib and pulseless V-tac. And remember to switch compressors every two minutes. The same with your defibrillations. You're defibrillating every two minutes as long as they're in a shockable rhythm and you're switching compressors with that two minutes defibrillation to keep that high quality cpr one fact that the american heart association stresses now is chest compression fraction our goal to, for chest compression fraction is at least 80 percent of the cardiac arrest somebody is doing compressions so Remember to minimize those interruptions in compressions to less than 10 seconds. You can keep compressing while the defibrillator is charging. And then if you need to shock, you're just going to hover. When they say clear, there's no more. Put your hands in the air. Stand back 20 feet. Hover six to eight inches above the chest. So as soon as the shock's delivered, you get back on cardiac compressions and those are how we can increase our chest compression fraction all right we started cpr got our oxygen hooked to our bvm got our monitor and defibrillator and we identified a shock algorithm v fib or pulses v tac don't delay shock right away after that sh shock occurs you're going to start cpr and get the work done start cpr and get the work done that's IV, IO access, and advanced airway in place. Steps one through three of the shockable side of the cardiac arrest algorithm is high quality CPR. Like I said, we're doing 30 compressions to two ventilations with that metronome. Dun, dun, dun. We're identifying our shockable rhythm, V fib or pulses V tac. And we are defibrillating every two minutes while they're in the shockable rhythm. The sequence is. If you don't know what brand of monitor is, you're just gonna charge to the max setting on the monitor. You're gonna clear the patient, which means hover, and then you're gonna push the defibrillation button as soon as you shock, then immediate CPR. Immediate CPR is steps one through three of the algorithm. The next step, step four, two minutes of CPR and get the work done. Initial ALS care, IVs, make sure you got O2 on there. We've got that ECG. 
So get IV or IO access and get an advanced airway ASAP. Why? Because once that advanced airway is in place, we can do continuous compressions and one breath every six seconds. If we do continuous compressions, then our chest compression fraction will be definitely over 80% because the only time we'll stop is when we are clearing to defibrillate and we'll make sure that's less than 10 seconds. And then of course, since we've got that advanced airway in place, continuous waveform capnography is the gold standard for confirming placement of an endotracheal tube. And we're gonna monitor the quality of our CPR. If it's less than 10, we need to increase that quality. So normally it's 10 to 20 for good compressions. Get the work done. Step five and six, remember shock. Don't delay, shock right away. Defibrillate every two minutes while in a shockable rhythm. We're charging the monitor max setting. We're clearing the patient with hover. Press the defibrillation button and start CPR. So then the first drug we're gonna consider is epinephrine. One milligram every three to five minutes for the duration of code. But we're trying to streamline it, make it a NASCAR pit stop. So hey, every four minutes, we're given one milligram of epinephrine. One milligram of epi every four minutes because every other shock is a four minute interval and we're gonna push an epi. So let's keep it simple. Next is step seven and eight of the algorithm. Step seven, shock. Don't delay, shock right away. Defibrillate every two minutes while they're in a shockable rhythm. Charge the monitor max setting, clear the patient with the hover, push the shock button, shock's delivered, start CPR. Go straight into CPR if they are still in VFib or pulseless VTAC, and now we consider an antiarrhythmic medication and that's amiodarone or lidocaine. Step eight, CPR. Our next drug are those antiarrhythmics, and that's amiodarone and lidocaine, and or lidocaine. Amiodarone first dose is 300 milligrams, and then second dose is 150. Remember, we're doing a shock, a drug of epi, a shock, amiodarone, a shock, a drug of epi, a shock, amiodarone. So that's the sequenced shock drug shock drug with this shockable cardiac arrest. With lidocaine we're going to go 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram for our loading dose and then subsequent doses are half of that loading dose 0.5 to 0.75. So hey every 5 to 10 minutes. So I say let's just keep it simple and do 1 milligram per kilogram. If you look at the Spock, we're down here. We're going to start with our one milligram per kilogram on our thumb. And then in five, 10 minutes, shock, drug, shock, drug, we're going to do a 0.5 milligrams. And then shock, drug, shock, drug, in five to 10 minutes, we're going to do another 0.5. That'll give us a two milligrams per kilogram. And then we do that shock, drug, shock, drug, another 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And then another shock drug, shock drug, another 0.5 of lidocaine, and then we'll max out at three milligrams per kilogram. So, and that's our antiarrhythmic medications for our shockable arrest. While we're going through all this shocking and drug medication administration, we're gonna start ruling out our reversible causes, our H's and our T's, and we have our hypoxia. Of course, you're going to put that BVM onto 100% oxygen when you're ventilating them. Hopefully, you got that advanced airway in place and you're breathing one breath every six seconds. We're going to slap the cap for continuous waveform capnography to monitor our quality of CPR and ET2 placement. And hypothermia is a reversible cause. Cover them up. Blankets underneath of them because I've never found a warm backboard yet. Blankets underneath of them and blankets on top of them. We lose most of the temperature from our heads, so cover their heads up also. And then 
Hypovolemia is a reversible cause, so we're going to be giving fluid boluses with that medication. And then also consider hyper and hypokalemia, that potassium. If, it, if you suspect hyperkalemia, you might give them some sodium bicarb to help push that potassium back into the cells. Remember your H's. And then we rule out the reversible causes of the T's. For those T's, we've got two in the heart, two in the chest. So, and then we got toxins. So we got cardiac tamponade, coronary thrombosis, pulmonary thrombosis, and tension pneumothorax, and then toxins to rule out our H's and T's. All right, and here is the left side of the cardiac arrest algorithm shockables. Gonna start CPR, hook up O2 to our BVM and get that defibrillator monitor. Yes, it's a shockable rhythm. It's V-fib pulses VTAC. Don't delay, shock right away. Then in that next CPR sequence, get those IVs, IOs, advanced airways in place. Then shock every two minutes while on a shockable rhythm. Then epinephrine, one milligram every four minutes while on a shockable rhythm. Then shock, and then consider that antiarrhythmic medication, amiodarone or lidocaine. Let's review the sequence, and then when do we stop? The shockable sequence with amiodarone, zero minutes. We're sh Don't delay, shock right away, we're gonna shock. Start CPR, get IV access and advanced airway, two minutes, we're gonna shock. We're doing CPR and giving that epi, one milligram every three, four minutes. One milligram every four minutes for the duration of the code. Four minute mark, we're gonna shock and CPR and we can give amiodarone, 300 milligrams bolus. And then six minutes, we're gonna shock. CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code. Eight minutes, shock. CPR, amiodarone, 150 milligram is the second dose. Then we're gonna, at the 10 minute mark, we're gonna shock and give some CPR and epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of the code. 12 minute shock, CPR, 14 minute shock, CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of the code. 16 minute shock, CPR, 18 minute shock, CPR, and epinephrine, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of the code. Shock to 20 minute mark and CPR is the, is the sequence. That's NASCAR pit stop. If you've ran a cardiac arrest, you know it doesn't always go as smooth as that, but that is our goal. Oh man, hold on to your hats, kids. We are shockable with lidocaine. Lidocaine takes a little longer because we're going to a max dose of three milligrams per kilogram. Zero. Time, we're gonna shock, CPR, IV, advanced airway, shock, CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code, shock, CPR, lidocaine, one milligram per kilogram every five to 10 minutes. That's where that timekeeper has to be on the ball. Six minute shock, CPR, epi, eight minute shock, CPR, 10 minute shock, CPR, we're in that sequence, epinephrine one milligram every four minutes for the duration of the code and then we've hit that five to ten minute mark with our lidocaine that next dose is 0.5 milligrams per kilogram 12 minute shock cpr 14 minutes shock epi one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code 16 minutes shock cpr and lidocaine 0.5 milligrams per kilogram every five to ten minutes 18 minutes shock so and at that 18 minute shock, we can do more CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code, and 20 minute shock, CPR, 22 minute shock, CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code, and lidocaine, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram every five to 10 minutes. 24 minute shock, CPR, 26 minute shock, CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration of code, 28 minute shock, CPR lidocaine, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, and we finally maxed out whew, at three milligrams per kilogram. 30 minutes shock, CPR, epi, one milligram every four minutes for the duration code, 32 minutes shock. Long time to max out. So the question is, when do we stop? When, 
question mark, stop or withhold resuscitative efforts if they have rigor mortis in place. If they're stiff as a board, you're not bringing them back. If they have a DNAR, it used to be a DNR, but now it's a DN, do not attempt resuscitation order. Or if there is something threatening your safety, you can't survive or help anybody if you're a patient too. Some other considerations to starting and stopping or how long you do it. If it's an overdose, you might work them a little longer. If it's a hypothermic patient that's been submerged, the old saying is, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. So you're gonna have to warm them up to pronounce them and stop. Or if you got a temporary return of spontaneous circulation, then you may consider to keep resuscitative efforts a little longer. In hospital considerations of when to stop, our time of collapse to CPR, how long was it? Time of collapse to defibrillation if needed. How many comorbidities do they have? What was their pre-arrest state? Stable, unstable. The initial rest, arrest rhythm, what did they start at? V-fib, a pulseless V-tac, or they started out in a systole and PEA. And the response to resuscitation. Did the person lay there unresponsive for hours before somebody noticed. And then here, end title. Get that advanced airway, slap the continuous waveform capnography and monitor that end title CO2. Remember that CO2 is getting off gas from your body is like smoke from the body's fire and metabolism. If the fire is not producing any smoke, then the metabolism is not working. So you can consider stopping if your end title is less than 10 after 20 minutes of resuscitative efforts. Because, well, there's no metabolism, not much smoke, and I doubt they'll come back to life. But there's a lot of things to consider. It's just not 20 minutes and done. Take all of those factors into consideration before you stop. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you American Heart Association for updating our emergency cardiac care algorithms every five years. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.